Today we're going to go through part 3 of our reflection in the Psalms, uh, particularly part 3 of Psalm 11, um, and this will be the final instalment. Uh, so Psalm chapter 11 to the choir master of David. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain, for behold the wicked bend the bow, they have fitted their arrow to the string, to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulphur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. So, in Psalm chapter 11, previously we explored the reality that God is our refuge. And... David responds to some of the counsel he receives and he he says that he won't flee to the mountain and the reason for that is because he knows that God is his protection, God is the one who preserves him, God is his deliverer, God is his fortress, God is his refuge and I emphasise the fact that the central aspect of this psalm is found in chapter 4. The Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. This is the central part of the psalm. And by that I mean that we come to realise that this is the essential point in David's communication with his counsel. He knows that God is in his holy temple, God is sovereign. His throne is in heaven. His throne is eternal. He's enthroned in glory with all power in his hand. He's powerful to save us. He's powerful to deliver us. This is a wonderful truth. But what David begins to do, as he goes through the rest of the psalm, he begins to expand and identify what he means by God being in the Holy Temple. The next thing he says is that his eyes see. David employs anthropomorphic language almost attributing human attributes to God in order to magnify his sovereignty when saying his eyes see David is saying that God sees every situation nothing escapes his watchful eye he does not slumber nor sleep so that means he sees what the wicked are doing He sees every action. But we have to look at ourselves also and realise that God sees beyond the outward. He sees the heart. He inspects our actions, our words and our thoughts. I mean, we see this in, in, I think it's John chapter 2 where Jesus says, you know, he, like, he didn't need like any man to sort of reveal himself for he knew what was in man and that's the paraphrase but it's showing he knows what was inside a man anyway as he's going through his ministry he can identify what the pharisees and sadducees are trying to say or want to say why because he knew their hearts he knew their motives he knew their thoughts you can almost liken this to a camera when a camera focuses on something it focuses to the point where Everything in the background is blurred. And so likewise, God sees each man perfectly, as if there was nothing else to look at, as if there was no other creature in the universe. He never removes his eye from us. Everything is right there before him. His eyes see. And David can be sure that God knows whether David is righteous. David can be sure that that God not only sees all, but he orchestrates every area of life. God is indeed sovereign. So the question now is that what can we learn from this? What we what can we come to gather from 
this reality here and how David is really magnifying the fact that God uh, sees all. Well, we must join David in having our confidence in the Lord. And again, remember that the psalm that what is ultimately about the psalms we see in the early, uh, in the early portion in Book One of the Psalter is that the king has confidence in God's care. David has confidence in God's care. We must join David in having his confidence in the Lord, because what he's bringing before us are sufficient grounds for confidence. These are these are sufficient grounds for confidence. And what what I mean by that is that. He's saying that God is sovereign and he sees all. So even though my life is at under, is in danger, God sees the danger. Even though I'm afflicted, God sees my affliction. God knows my affliction. Nothing is hidden from him. I can rest assured because I have God as my refuge and he is in control. <clears throat> but not only, is he in, well, not only is he in control, but the Lord tests the righteous his eyelids test the children of man again we need to make sure we have a good understanding of this word test here why because we'll later come to see that this is contrasted with the lord hating the wicked but i'll get that onto that in a second the first thing we realize is that it's God's prerogative. David knows that it's God's prerogative to test his people if he is so pleased to do so. But then, but, but we must realise that, from, from number one, if God will test us, it's for his glory. And number two, it's for our good. And these are essential things to realise. God testing us is not something that will... That will not bear fruit. In fact, there are many benefits to our afflictions, and it's because we are precious to God that He refines us with afflictions. And just to take a quick cursory glance of the scriptures, we can see this in in a variety of places. So, firstly, Psalm one hundred nineteen, verse seventy one. It says, "It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn Your statutes." So we have the idea of that affliction there, that test, that difficulty and so what we must gather here is that affliction drives us to God's word it literally gives us a reason to dive into the scriptures one one brother once said to me that God knows what he must do to bring us before his throne of grace God knows what he must do to drive us to prayer and to drive us to his word. And even reflect with me for a moment. If not for this COVID-19 pandemic, if not for institutional racism and police brutality against the black community, if not for the sheer difficulties you face on a day-to-day basis, would you be praying as much? Would you be reading the scriptures as much? In fact, as a result of the pandemic, what we've seen is a lot of Bible studies. We've seen Bible study after Bible study. As a result of the the Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen Bible study after Bible study. There is such a wealth of resources out there. And we're driven to listen to this and to read this and to pray and to ask the Lord to help us with anger or whatever it may be. Affliction drives us to God's word. And you must realise that this is one of the reasons the Lord would afflict us. Because he knows what to do to drive us to him. To, 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 to ensure that we are fleeing to God, asking for his help and, and seeking his, 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 his wisdom which is found in his word that we would live for his glory. <clears throat> Affliction drives us to God's word. Uh, moving on swiftly, Second Corinthians 12 verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited, this is Paul, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a form was given me in the flesh. So, he says to keep him from being conceited. In other words, affliction, the form that he was given in his flesh, which is the affliction here, affliction keeps him from pride. So, it keeps from pride. So, in other words, his affliction is keeping him from sinning. It keeps him from pride and it 
causes him to magnify God's strength because what he says afterward in verse 9 a bit later on is that in my weakness, God's strength is made perfect. God is not going to remove this form. He'll keep it there to keep him humble. And in his weakness, he knows that God's strength is made perfect. And we, we see this in every area of life that God oftentimes would would make us come to the end of ourselves. That it would rely on him. That when you're going for this job interview, you're not going to magnify your CV and your intellect. I have to come to the end of myself and realize that no one will be blessed or ministered to by this study in the Psalms, if not for God and by the help of his Holy Spirit touching the hearts of men. We must come to the end of ourselves and realize that I cannot do anything. I cannot change anyone's heart. I cannot get this job in of my own self. I must rely on God. His strength is made perfect in our weakness and oftentimes he'll bring us to the end of ourselves and make us realize through affliction that I am weak, I cannot do anything, I am but dust. And then we realize that everything I have is all of grace, is all of his mercy. It's because of God's strength and God's power that I can do anything. And affliction, God will bring afflictions that we would learn these things. We'd be kept from sin and we would magnify his strength. Hebrews 12, 6 says that the Lord disciplined the one whom he loves. He chastises every son whom he receives. And it also goes on to speak about a variety of things. So first we must realise that affliction from God, God as a heavenly father, afflicting us. Again, this shows that God loves us. It shows that we are true children. We are not illegitimate children of God. We are true children. But also we realise also that it goes on to speak about how in being afflicted and being disciplined, we will share in his holiness. It keeps us on the path of holiness. But more than that as well, it says that we would yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So this is like, you know, what a package. What a package this is. What a hat trick as it were. God afflicting us is a wonderful thing. Because it shows that God loves us. We're true children. We share in his holiness. We will yield a peaceable fruit of righteousness. Blessing after blessing after blessing. And so our mind has to change in the way in which we come to understand affliction. Because oftentimes we think that, you know, why me or why am I in this situation? And we fail to see that there are many benefits from it. God sovereignly orchestrates things for his glory, but also for our good. So when we look at verses like, the Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked. Again, there's almost a juxtaposition there because he tests the righteous, but we can easily see that say that he loves the righteous. He hates the wicked, but he loves the righteous. For those whom the Lord would, the Lord, uh, those whom the Lord would afflict, he, he loves. And if you're not afflicted by God, you should be quite concerned and and examine your heart and say, you know, am I truly in the faith? Am I walking as He would have me to walk? The Lord loves the righteous, the Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. It's the perfect contrast. Going back to David now, another reason why David does not flee to the mountain or fear the wicked is because God abhors them. It doesn't make sense for David to fear those people whom God will ultimately punish for all eternity. God hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. And oftentimes it's those who love violence who will now ultimately receive a just rep- recompense of reward. For it's, it's ironic that, you know, Haman in, in the book of Esther, for example, he loved the violence. He made gallows for Mordecai that, would, that Mordecai would be, would be hung upon. But ultimately, you know, it, and ironically, it was used for Haman. Those who bear the bow against God will receive a just reward. David is aware of this. And even now, applying it to, again, present day, even now as many would cry out for justice in the face of police brutality, for example, and be angry and say, when, Lord, you know, let's not forget that God says vengeance is mine. You know, he will repay. God hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Again, there's more. It goes on to say, let him rain coals on the wicked. Let me put red here for danger. For danger. 
Let them rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. So again, let's focus on fire and sulfur. This is reminiscent of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so, Sodom and Gomorrah, we go, we go to Genesis to see how in this particular instance, God rains down fire and sulfur on the city, even after Abraham petitioned God to not destroy it for the sake of perhaps ten righteous people. And God did not find any righteous there apart from Lot. So, David knows that whether in this life or the next, the portion of the wicked will be fire and sulfur and a scorching wind. They will be punished. God's wrath burns against the wicked. Those who are pursuing him, God's wrath burns against them. And David can rest in God knowing he is his refuge and knowing that if God hates the wicked, why am I apprehensive of these people? For God will deal with them in his perfect timing. And David concludes in a wonderful thought. He knows that God will deal with them. Why? Because the Lord is righteous. The Lord is just. The Lord does all things well. He's the God of the entire universe who does that which is right. And this verse provides another wonderful reason for why we should be steadfast and rest in God as our refuge as opposed to following the ways of the wicked and seeking security in the in, in the mountains of this world. The Lord loves righteous deeds. We're to be rich in good works. And has as he is righteous, he will defend the righteous. God knows God I mean David knows that God is righteous, so therefore he will defend me, for I am righteous, I've done no wrong. It will be inconsistent with God's nature to not do so. So we we, we do well to to bear this in mind. It's the very essence of God to be just in all his dealings. And therefore, on a horizontal level, we should we should strive to be so as well. And as we do so, God indeed delights in that. He sees his own image in us. The upright shall behold his face. So again, this idea of righteousness. The Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright or the righteous will behold his face. They will know his presence. They will know he is with them. And if we call God our refuge, we can be sure that he is with us. And we will experience that. We will know a, a, a realness of that. Spurgeon comments on this verse by saying, you know, are we tempted to put our light under a bushel? And our, our righteous deeds, perhaps, that he may be referring to there, to conceal our religion from our neighbours. Is it, is it suggested to us that there are ways of avoiding the cross and shunning the reproach of Christ? Let, let us not hearken to these voices, but seek an increase in faith that we would wrestle against the principalities and powers and follow the Lord and bear his reproach because mammon, the flesh and the devil will all whisper in our ear, flee as a bird to your mountain. But let us come and defy them, defy them all. Resist, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And, and, and what he's pointing out to here is that the world, the wicked, they, they, there will be great temptation to not do the will of God, to not flee to the, to the, the true refuge, but to, 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 to indulge in the things of this world. But, but we, we must not yield to that temptation. And in conclusion, you must also realise that God's wrath burned against us also for our sin. And the only reason we do not drink from the cup of God's wrath is because Jesus drank it for us. Jesus took our punishment upon himself by drinking the cup of God's judgment. And even though he prayed that this cup, the symbol of suffering and divine anger, he prayed that it will pass from him. But he prays, not my will, but yours be done, ultimately. And so we can rejoice in that our sin is taken care of. We can have God as our refuge. We can hide in him and rest in him. And the only cup that we now drink is the cup of the new covenant. Indeed, it is not evidence of the upright beholding the face of God. And we do well to praise God for that. Amen. Um.